Hello and welcome to KAUS Live. We're coming to you from the Clean Combustion Research Center on KAUS campus. Uh, the Future of Fuels Research Conference is currently underway. So Hassan Babakar of Saudi Aramco and John Farrell of the National Renewable Energy Labs have stopped by to talk to us about the future of fuels and particularly how they pertain to the transport sector. So gentlemen, thank you for joining us. We thank you very much. Thank you. for having us. So Hassan, um, you're speaking at the conference about energy demand curves um, and how they affect the future of mobility. So talk to us a little bit about that. Right. So, um, so looking, looking to the future, we see uh, uh, um, a big uh, growth in demand for, for energy, mm -hmm. uh, particularly coming from uh, non-OECD countries, uh, China, India, places like this. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of this will be driven by the need for mobility, transport, and so on, as as people, uh, you know, buy more and more cars. Um, but also as you know, the the these countries drive uh, drive towards development um, and uh, an improved quality of life. Mm -hmm. The need for for energy will will increase, and that's bound to have an effect on on our sector on oil on other forms of energy mm -hmm. um, and uh, so what what we try to do is try to understand you know what that impact might look like and and how can we mitigate the uh, the, the 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 more negative impacts of uh, you know of uh, of these energy sources sure um, give us a sense for when we say there's a an uptick or a growth in that um, demand for energy what, what what kind of percentages maybe we're we talking about well, I mean, as I said, it's, it's region dependent. So, I mean, if okay. you look at places like Europe, um, uh, certainly from the transport sector, I mean, that's likely to sort of start tailing off in the light duty sector, things like that. Mm. But, I mean, in China, you could see a, a 40, 50 percent increase over the next, uh, wow. uh, um, you know, um, 30 to 40 years. You mm. know? So, um, uh, overall, it is going to be quite significant, and um, although engine efficiencies are going to improve, mm -hmm. um, there will still be a there will still be more a demand for more and more energy. Interesting. So, okay. Yeah. Now, John, um, you're currently part of the Cooptima project, so right. so give us a sense for what that is and how that relates to uh, future fuels. Sure. So, building on what Hassan said, the mm -hmm. Uh, United States in particular is also going to see a plateauing of light duty fuel use, but heavy mm -hmm. duty is projected to grow, and that's also a worldwide trend. And a lot of the motivation behind the co-op project is in recognition that, you know, today's engineers have done a tremendous job of taking um, di diesel engines and gasoline engines and squeezing a lot of efficiency and emissions performance out of them. Mm -hmm. But further increases are possible, although today's fuels constrain the um, operating space and um, provide some compromises. We've been looking at the problem from the standpoint of if you allowed the engines to operate on the best possible fuels that allow them to get the best efficiency and the best emissions, mm -hmm. what would those fuels look like? So we want to understand the trade-off between engine design and fuel parameters and really converge on a solution that's co-optimized for the best overall performance. Interesting, okay. The, and thus the name Co-Optima. Hence the name. <laughs> Um, so you also manage an R&D portfolio that has a number of different things, including batteries and energy storage, power electronics, grid interactions, et cetera. So, right. so talk about maybe one or two of those things and how they're relating also to the future fuels. Sure. I'll actually touch on the integration of the electrification as well as the internal combustion engine. Because Great. There is a, a lot of focus now on the role of electrification in um, not only light duty transport, but heavy duty as well. Mm -hmm. And some people are suggesting that the death of the IC engine is imminent. Now, there have been magazine articles and much press related to that. And I think the recognition is that for people who are familiar with the scale of the transportation problem, especially with um, the fueling of billions of vehicles, mm -hmm. that the role of electrification in the IC engine are really harmonious. There are ways that the electrification can help the IC engine, especially some of these advanced powertrains. Um, having an electrified powertrain in conjunction with an IC engine allows you to get really the best of both of these. So mm -hmm. there will undoubtedly be some light duty vehicles that operate solely on batteries. We see that now. Um, right. Some trucks may even move towards that. But the role of electrification to enable advanced IC engines, I think, is an area that people are beginning to appreciate now as a real opportunity space. I see. And, and what kind of reductions in fuel needs does that electrification bring if it doesn't completely offset it? Right. So there's a continuum. You can go from mm -hmm. a very lightly electrified powertrain. Um, conventionally, these are thought of in terms of the stop-start. Your car comes yeah. up to a stoplight. It turns off the motor so it's not idling. Mm -hmm. um, but still, most of the power is provided by the engine. 
On the other extreme, the battery is providing the entire power for the vehicle at all right. times. So depending on where you are within that continuum, you can see reductions of maybe 25, 30% all the way to you know, complete elimination of liquid fuel use. Wow. Um, but the right solution is going to be somewhere in between, depending on how you use your, your car. Right, or a, a mix of all of those things, indeed. Probably. Yes. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think the, the ICE is going to remain a part of uh, the powertrain for a long time to come. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're, we're not going to be able to switch over to EVs uh, uh, completely for a long, long, long time. Right. Uh, I mean, there are, it is part of the solution, I think, in certain parts of the world. Uh, and uh, where it makes sense, I think it certainly will, uh, will become uh, you know, a technology choice. But um, the ICE is still a formidable uh, piece of uh, equipment. Um, and yeah. uh, I think there are, uh, there are strong opportunities for improvements of, uh, of ice efficiency, particularly when you bring the fuel into, uh, into, into the matter, uh, right. as, as John was saying earlier. Right. Um, and your team at Aramco yes. um, is working on some, some new technologies. So yes. give us a little overview about um, what you guys are doing. So, um, so one of the main technologies that we're uh, we're focusing on is gasoline compression ignition, um, and this is something actually uh, that John referred to in his uh, in his talk uh, as well. Uh, so it's where we're looking at using a gasoline fuel in in what looks like a diesel engine, essentially. Mm -hmm. So diesel engines are inherently more efficient than uh, spark ignited engines, um, and um, but. The challenge has been with with these is managing the emissions um, associated with uh, with that type of uh, that type of combustion. Mm -hmm. uh, what gasoline allows you to do, uh, due to the sort of longer ignition delays, it allows better mixing, um, which can help reduce the reduce the emissions associated with the combustion. Um, and uh, with all the advances that we've seen in the diesel engine, particularly with the uh, injection systems and so on, and the controls that are there, mm -hmm. we're now uh, approaching a point where putting gasoline into a, a compression ignition engine starts to look, look feasible. So you can start to uh, run gasoline at similar efficiencies to diesel and um, you can also uh, get some of the benefits associated on the emission side as well. So, so, so that, rather than transitioning countries like Saudi to more diesel for the, the personal cars and things, you'd be just trying to reach those efficiency levels uh, with gas? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's certainly an opportunity. It's, mm. it's, 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 it's an opportunity. Uh, I mean, the diesel engine is still a very, uh, is, is still a very efficient engine, and it makes sense in, in many sectors, for sure. Mm. Um, and uh, I know that it's got a lot of bad press recently with the emissions uh, scandals. Um, <laughs> right. But, but uh, it's an engine that can be kept, that can be clean, in my view. It's mm. a case of, uh, you know, how much you spend in terms of cleaning up the, uh, the after-treatment system. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so GCI is one technology that we're uh, that we're working on. In fact, we have uh, we have a presence at the Geneva Auto Show, which is starting up this week, uh, oh. where we're showcasing several of our technologies. And GCI is, uh, is is the sort of flagship technology that we're showing there. Mm -hmm. We have a vehicle um, and an engine that we've been develop we've been developing uh, over the last few years, which is on display. So, uh, so if you get a chance, uh, take a look. Maybe uh, you might see us there. That's exciting. Yeah. yeah. And, and and I I wonder um, as you talk about diesel versus gas engines, and this this is probably for both of you, frankly. Like, which of them integrates better with some of these new um, electric uh, tied technologies? Uh, maybe John, you can address that. Too. So I think we, what we hear from the car makers is that you know the electrified powertrains and then the conventional powertrains, mm -hmm. you know, they can be both very expensive. So if you want something that appeals to the consumers, you want to make sure you've got something that they can afford that yeah. will provide the same performance. Diesel powertrains are inherently a more expensive technology. Um, so that's one reason why you haven't seen as many diesel hybrids as gasoline hybrids. Another reason, of course, is the higher inherent efficiency of the diesels. So from a consumer standpoint, you know, if you want to get the best efficiency, um, and the best emissions, then the combination of a gasoline and uh, electric powertrain is probably the, the most um, consumer-friendly approach, just given the economics of that. Okay, interesting, yeah. And that uh, seems to have been, uh, diesel seems to have been the way that Europe has gone. Why, why is that different from uh, some of the developing countries as, as well as North America? Um, I don't know, maybe you can talk to North America, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't know, but um, I mean, diesel is now in decline in Europe as well, um, oh, okay. and that's uh, that's perhaps driven uh, perhaps by the uh, by the, the uh, uh, an recent announcements maybe that some governments have made in Europe uh, about you know how they see the future of diesel. I see. Um, so 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 it is in it is in decline. 
um, which, which is a shame because I mean I actually think it's a technology that can offer mm -hmm. um, that can offer um, CO2 benefits, which is you know which is the concerns that are driving a lot of regulations around uh, around the world. Sure. Um, and um, uh, it's it, you know it, it's it's probably. I, in my view, a technology that can be that can be uh, much 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 cleaner. So. And, I, and I don't want to impose my bias just because I drive a gasoline-powered okay. uh, car. What other fuels are out there that are maybe potentially in the mix, um, uh, you know, to replace or or at least augment the the current mix right now? Well, I mean, like like I said, I mean, we're looking at putting gasoline into a uh, into a diesel engine. I mean, we right. see that as uh, you know providing. Um, uh, big benefits. Right. Um, however, um, the the what, what we've been looking at is market gasoline. Um, okay. As um, it, there, there's certainly opportunities, I think, to uh, extend the benefits if you yeah. if you optimize the fuel for that particular combustion. Mm -hmm. um, and this is this is the type of work that John actually was talking about in in, in his presentation on the Optima program. Oh, right. So uh, th there is uh, uh, there is an uh, an opportunity when you co-optimize the fuels and engines together uh, to extract further benefits. Uh, right. There's an opportunity to lower the carbon content of your fuel, to yeah. lower the, uh, the CO2 associated with the manufacturing of your fuel. So you can start to impact, uh, by, by looking at the fuel and the engine together, you can start to impact the, uh, the life cycle impact, the, the, the life cycle effect yeah. uh, and CO2 emissions uh, of, your, uh, of your mobility solution. Oh, very good. And then I guess the last question is then how does all of this impact the infrastructure that you put in place? In 10 or 15 years, do you gas stations, do, do, does delivery of these future fuels, does it change much or is that relatively going to be the same, do you think? I think one of the challenges that we've gotten a better appreciation of as researchers as we're looking at um, putting new fuels into the marketplace is just how much the retail infrastructure and the consumer experience really matters. If you want to have a feasible solution, you have to address those realistic yeah. um, constraints. So for example, in the United States, most of the fuel retailing stations have two tanks on the ground for the, your regular gasoline and your um, premium gasoline, then you mm -hmm. blend to mix the two. If you have a new fuel solution that requires a new tank, then that's basically a non-starter. So uh, in the future, you really are, if you want to have a widespread uh, deployment of new fuel, you have to tap into what's already in place because yeah. otherwise the costs become exorbitant pretty yeah. quickly. Interesting, okay. Yeah, and I think the other challenge with new fuels as well, I mean, you need, uh, you need many other stakeholders on board. Uh, I mean, at the moment you can't sell uh, road fuels without the right regulations in place. So you need the regulators on board. You need to uh, sort of articulate the, the benefits, I guess, of those fuels. You need mm -hmm. the, uh, the car manufacturers on board. Uh, so it's a, it's a very big challenge, actually, uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to launch a new fuel onto the market. Yeah, absolutely. Well, very good. Well, gentlemen, thank you for, for coming to Kauston. I uh, hope the conference has, has been enjoyable. Absolutely. Uh, it's been yes. outstanding. Yeah. Well, thank you both. We appreciate it. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you. And that's all the time we have for today. Make sure to comment, like, and share on all the KAUST social channels. And from all of us at KAUST, thank you for joining us.